The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus said to his disciples, Go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak new languages. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, the Lord Jesus, after he spoke to them, was taken up into heaven and took his seat at the right hand of God. But they went forth and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word through accompanying signs. The Gospel of the Lord. The Apostles' Creed, which we pray every Sunday during the Easter season, contains a summary statement of the story of Jesus Christ. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Now, of all of those events in the life of our Lord, we t tend to emphasize only three. His birth, his death, and his resurrection. But today our focus is on the fourth, without which history would be incomplete, namely the ascension. Mark's gospel says, the Lord was taken up into heaven and took his seat at the right hand of God. The book of the Acts of the Apostles said, he was lifted up before their eyes in a cloud which took him from their sight. Why is this event even recorded in the New Testament? What, sig what significance does it have for the church? The most obvious answer is, without those two statements and others like them, we would be left wondering what became of Jesus after the resurrection. For 40 days, he made intermittent appearances to his followers. We've been telling those stories. And then suddenly, those appearances ceased. And he has not been seen again for almost 2,000 years. If indeed he is alive, where is he now? His ascension is the answer to that question. But it's more than that. It has a deep and profound meaning for the church beyond being the solution to a historical puzzle. For one thing, it takes our faith out of the physical realm and places it solidly in the spiritual realm. Suppose that the risen Christ had stayed with his disciples in the same way 
that they had always known him. Suppose his relationship with them had simply taken up where it left off before the cross. One can easily surmise what would have happened. The disciples would have remained forever dependent upon the familiar form and the sound of a familiar voice. Their faith would never have grown beyond the level of things visible and tangible. They would have counted on his presence and his power as long as he was in view. But whenever he went beyond their limited range of vision, they would have felt like abandoned children. Now on the night before his death, Jesus told them at the Last Supper, it's much better for you that I go away. If I fail to go, the Holy Spirit will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now those words must have sounded incredible to them on that night. How could it be possibly be better for them that Jesus should go away? But his promise proved to be true. As long as his, his presence was visible and tangible, he was confined by the limitations of time and space. He could not be with them always and everywhere. Their togetherness would have been a repetition series, repetitious series of greetings and farewells as Jesus went in and out of their presence. But his ascension opened the door to a new relationship. The Holy Spirit was with each of them at all times and in all places. And the same is true for you and me. Christ is with us here in this church today. Did he not promise that where two or three are gathered in his name, he would be in their midst? But when we leave the church and go about our Sunday, we will not leave him. He will go with me. And he will go with each of you. His ascension has taken our faith out of the physical realm and planted it solidly in the spiritual realm. What those first disciples thought would be an irre irreplaceable loss has turned out to be an irreversible gain. It's a strange paradox, but his going away actually became the fulfilling of his promise to be with us always until the end of the world. It also lifted our faith out of a very local setting to give it worldwide dimension. Think back of how Christianity started. A young woman is found to be pregnant before marriage. Her baby's born in a stable. The child grows up and becomes the village carpenter. He gives up his trade and pursues the life of a traveling teacher and preacher. A few fishermen forsake their boats and nets in order to become his followers. But then public sentiment turns against Jesus and a cross is raised in an obscure hill outside of Jerusalem. He dies and is buried in a borrowed tomb. And a few days later, a rumor begins to circulate that he is risen from the dead. It's a lovely story but one that has a very local flavor. He was a Jew, a resident of Galilee, and all of his followers were of the same race. His movement appeared to be nothing more than an effort to reform the Jewish faith. At one point he himself said, 
My mission is only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The closing of that first stage of his ministry was the opening of another. His final directives to his disciples were, were this, was this. Go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. After his ascension, they proceeded to do exactly that. When he was no longer visibly present to a privileged few, his message belonged to people everywhere. And finally, it was his ascension that activated the church and sent it out, carrying on his work. Mark says the Lord Jesus was taken up into heaven and took his seat at the right hand of God, but then in the very next sentence he says, the eleven went forth and preached everywhere. What did they preach? One thing, and one thing only. It was not a philosophy of life, but a fact of history. They preached Jesus Christ crucified, buried, raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sitting at the right hand of God. And with that conviction burning in their souls, they took right up where Jesus had left off. They continued to do and to teach all the things that he had done and taught. They became his feet to carry the light of truth into every dark corner of the world. They became his hands to reach out in deeds of mercy. The disciples became his voice to share the story of their redeeming love with a lost and confused human race. And his departure made it clear that they were now his agents on earth. It was their mission to reincarnate their Lord and carry on his work. And now that mission has passed on to you and to me. We are his hands, his feet, and his voice. And he's counting on us to continue his work. This is what the ascension of Christ means to the church. At first, it seemed the end of a great adventure. Instead, it is proven to be the inspiration and power to carry on that adventure to the very end of time.